Pac-Man was a very big part of my childhood. Ever since I was a young boy, I've loved Pac-Man, but the game that was most responsible for this overwhelming love for the yellow guy is Pac-Man World 2. I hate to open this review with the cliché childhood stuff, but this game is really important to me. It's had a huge impact on me and my taste in games, and that's stuck with me for years. However, despite the game's overall pretty decent sales and critical praise, no one really seems to be talking about it nowadays. So today I'm going to be taking a look at Pac-Man World 2, see if this is an underappreciated gem or if it fails to hold up. This is my review of Pac-Man World 2. To kick off this review, I'll be talking about the story, and don't worry, I won't be spending 20 minutes on it this time. The four men go to Pac-Land, invade the Pac Village in the middle of the night, and after a bit of goofing around and somehow not waking up the entire town despite making a lot of noise and even alerting Pac-Man's dog Chomp Chomp, they steal the five golden fruit from the tree in the center of the village. Unbeknownst to the ghost, this tree houses an ancient evil spirit named Spooky that, once freed, enlists the ghost to help him defeat Pac-Man and rid the world of the entire race of Pac-People forever. For a light-hearted, cheery game, game about eating fruit, I wasn't really expecting a villain whose goal is mass genocide. That's pretty over the top. The next day, Pac-Man wakes up to find the golden fruit tree stripped of its titular fruit, and Professor Pac-Man explains to him the backstory of said tree and fruit. He tells a story straight from a history book of how in ancient times, Spooky had been attacking Pac-Land when the great wizard Pac created a potion to transform Pac-Land's fruit into the golden fruit, which Sir pac lot then used to help him overpower Spooky and trap him inside the golden fruit tree. Pac-Man sets off to follow in Sir pac footsteps and retrieve the five golden fruit and defeat Spooky once more. And that's it! No complicated subplots, no character development, just a standard, simple plot to act as context for the adventure that Pac-Man embarks on. And it works pretty well! On one hand, it is a very simple premise, so it's not too interesting, but on the other hand, you don't play a Pac-Man game for the story, you play it for the gameplay, which is something that Pac-Man World 3 didn't seem to understand. The biggest issue I have with the story is that if this tree was so important to keeping this ancient evil locked away, why wouldn't they try and protect it better? Aside from a small town with like 8 houses in it, there's not much keeping anyone from sneaking in and unleashing Spooky, so I'm just left wondering how this hasn't happened already. However, this is more of a nitpick since the plot of the game ultimately doesn't matter that much. While we're talking about plot, I want to mention the voice acting, because this game actually has some. You there, take these golden fruit that imprisoned me and follow me. Spooky's voice is deep, dramatic, and booming, making for a villain that seems really intimidating at first, but since you don't see him again until the end of the game, ends up losing that effect by the time you actually face off with him. Ancestors fought against this very evil. In ancient times, the great wizard Pack created a powerful potion that turned five fruit from Packland into the golden fruit. Professor Pack's voice actor reprises his role from Miss Pac Man's Madness, and it's still a wonderful voice. I absolutely love the way he slightly rolls his R's in a goofy accent, and the lines are all delivered really well. The ending cutscene also features a couple lines from the ghosts, Inky, Blinky, Pinky, and Clyde, and they sound kinda dopey. It's only a couple lines though, so it's not really an issue at all. Also, they somehow got Blinky and Clyde's names switched. In this game, Clyde is the red ghost, and Blinky is the orange ghost. This issue would continue through Pac-Man World 3 and Pac-Man Collection. Anyway, the voice acting is overall well done, despite not really needing to be, since there's only about a page of voice acted dialogue in the entire game. Now with the story stuff done, let's talk about the aesthetics. Pac-Man World 2 is pretty great in the aesthetics front. It boasts a beautiful, colorful art style with very level geometry and a really great soundtrack. Going back to the intro cutscene, and the music fits it absolutely perfectly. The best way I can describe this track is delightfully evil. Just take a listen. The only real problem with the soundtrack is that it's kind of repetitive. Each of the six worlds in the game seem to have one main theme, and each of the three levels within those worlds all have a slightly different variation on that theme, as well as another variation for the boss fights. So while playing the game, you'll hear 24 different songs, but it feels more like it's only 12, since the different variations of the songs within each world all kind of seem to mesh together, save for the boss's themes. Despite the same variations, the songs themselves are great, well-composed, and a joy to listen to. The other big complaint I have about the aesthetics is the level theming. 
The original Pac-Man world had creative and unique level themes, such as a clown world, a pirate world, a ruins world, and a haunted mansion world. The unique level themes helped Pac-Man world stand out from your typical 3D platformer and was one of its greatest aspects. However, in Pac-Man World 2, they went with a much more basic set of level themes. You get Grass World, Forest World, Ice World, Lava World, Water World, and Ghost World. The only real unique one in there is ripped straight from Pac-Man World 1, and is pretty much required to be the final area of any Pac-Man game anyway, so the majority of the game can feel kind of bland. However, despite the unoriginal world themes, the game does boast some great set pieces, such as bouncing atop a forest of giant trees, being chased down a mountain by a giant snowball, ice skating down a giant mountain littered with ice caverns, exploring caves filled with tikis and waterfalls, going inside of a volcano and shifting lava levels, and roller skating through a spooky boardwalk. These take what would be pretty boring levels and transforms them into something a lot more memorable. Despite some minor gripes, I think Pac-Man World 2 has overall good aesthetics that help make the game more interesting. So with that said, let's move on to the gameplay. Remember how I said earlier that having a simple story is fine so long as there's a good focus on gameplay and the game itself is fun? Well, that's where Pac-Man World 2 starts to collapse in on itself. The best way I can describe Pac-Man World 2's gameplay is an identity crisis. This game doesn't know whether it wants to stay true to Pac-Man's maze or roots, improve upon the formula set by the original Pac-Man world, or become a full-blown collect-a-thon and innovate on the franchise even more. The result is a mess of mechanics that constantly battle with each other and can leave the player very frustrated. Before we can really get into the meat of Pac-Man World 2's gameplay, we need to talk about the controls, because this game really doesn't hold your hand, and expects the player to have a full understanding of its physics from the moment you turn on the game. For the purposes of explaining the controls, I'll be using the buttons of the GameCube controller since that's the version I played, so just translate that to whatever system you would be playing it on. You can make Pac-Man jump with the A button, and we already have a problem. Pac-Man's jump height is always the same no matter how long you hold in the jump button, so making precise jumps can be pretty difficult. However, to remedy this, you can also make Pac-Man do a kickflip by pressing B in the air, which will cut Pac-Man's jump short, allowing you to control his jump height more efficiently. Despite having the same effect as just holding the jump button to jump higher, I can only wonder as to why they decided to make this simple task of controlling your jump height map to an entirely different move. It just seems needlessly complicated. You can also use this kickflip move as a mid-air attack, but you won't be making much use of the kickflip for that purpose outside of breaking some hovering boxes in a few levels, and you'd be hard-pressed to kill an enemy with it. While in the air, you can also make Pac-Man do a butt bounce by pressing A again, which is a much more useful form of attack for taking care of enemies both on the ground and in the air. The butt bounce can also help you make more precise jumps for platforming, so it's a pretty useful move to have in Pac-Man's arsenal. You can also make Pac-Man charge a rev roll by holding B while on the ground, and releasing it will cause Pac-Man to shoot off in whatever direction you're aiming, similarly to Sonic Spin Dash. This can make traversing large gaps and rolling off of ramps a lot easier. You can also stop your momentum from a rev roll by pressing A, and this is very important. The game does explain this to you, but it's not made quite clear just how important it is. You really need to master the rev roll and canceling it to get through some of the trickier platforming sections as well as collecting some of the more hard to get collectibles. Other than that, Pac-Man can shimmy across ledges and hop off of them with the B button, and boost during the underwater levels with the B button. Holding L will put you into a slightly more first-person mode, but not quite first-person, in which Pac-Man can still move, albeit very slowly and with tank controls. Pressing R during the mazes will change the camera type, and during normal gameplay will zoom the camera either slightly in or slightly out. It might seem kind of unnecessary to explain in detail every facet of the controls, but trust me, you really need a full understanding of how this game plays to get through it. Pac-Man World 2 features a laundry list of collectibles in every level to encourage exploration of the levels and a better understanding of the game's controls and mechanics. Like I mentioned before, Pac-Man World 2 tries to be a collectathon, but it doesn't really fully commit to it. You have a checklist of collectibles for each level, but you're only shown how many of each item there is after you beat the level, and even then, pausing only shows you how many you currently have and not how many you need. These collectibles include pack dots, various fruits, and a Galaxian that will take you to a classic Pac-Man style maze. The first big problem with this game is that if you want to 100% this game, which I did for the purposes of this review, for any given level to be 100%, you need to collect every single pack dot, fruit, and galaxian all in one run of the level. And while it can be very frustrating to get all the way through a level only to realize you missed one fruit or a few pack dots and have to do the entire thing all over again, it wouldn't be that bad if you had a checklist you could look at from within the level itself. Now sure, you could just run through the level, see how many of everything there is, write the amounts all down, and then go through the level again with your own checklist to make it easier to keep track of, but that's just overly cumbersome and complicated. Along with that, the level design itself contradicts with the collect-a-thon style gameplay since all of the levels are totally linear, with many levels not giving you the ability to backtrack. 
This means you'll be constantly running into do or die situations where if you miss just one dot or fruit, you'll have to kill yourself and go back to the last checkpoint. Or in some cases, you miss a collectible that you can't go back for and aren't able to kill yourself before you hit another checkpoint, meaning you have to start the entire level over and get everything again. And to make matters worse, you have the Galaxians. I fucking despise the Galaxians. Picking one of these up will take you to a maze in the style of the original Pac-Man. You get three lives, there are four ghosts, you collect a bunch of pac dots before the three lives are exhausted, and you win. Seems simple enough, but once you exit a maze, whether you completed it or not, you're automatically given a checkpoint and the Galaxian disappears. No option to retry, no way to get extra lives within the mazes, and no other option but to restart the entire level if you fuck up. And with some of the harder levels having Galaxians at the very end, like Blade Mountain, this can be incredibly frustrating. Fortunately, I only failed a Galaxian maze maybe once or twice throughout the whole game, but you gotta keep in mind that I've been playing this game for well over 10 years. I'm very experienced with it, and even then I still messed up a couple of times. You can also visit the arcade in the Pack Village to practice the mazes, but they only unlock once you finish the level with the Galaxian collected, so what's even the point of having that? This is such an unforgiving mechanic, I have no idea why they implemented it this way. Anyway, alongside the main collectibles, each level also has 8 tokens hidden throughout, as well as 2 bonus tokens you can get. One from getting every collectible in one run, and one for beating the time trial for that level. The time trials aren't that bad if you fully understand the game's mechanics and controls, but in time trial mode you're given no checkpoints at all, meaning you have to beat the level all in one life, relatively quickly, and while picking up enough clocks to freeze the timer so you beat the time trial. Now if you've been following me for a long time, you may know that I actually used to speedrun this game, and even with my speedrunning history, I still ended up failing one of the time trials. Trials. Like a lot of other things in this game, the time trials seem simple on the surface, but once you dig deeper you find more and more questionable design choices that can make them unnecessarily difficult and frustrating. So with all that, that's 10 tokens in every level, not including the pack village which only has 9 since there's no time trial on that level. That's a total of 189 tokens in the game, so what do you get for going out of your way to get all 189? Well, you do get something, but only sort of. In the Pack Village, there are two buildings that require tokens to use, a museum that unlocks a slideshow of concept art that unlocks once you've collected 150 tokens, and an arcade with four different Pac-Man games that all unlock at certain intervals of tokens. The original Pac-Man unlocks at 10 tokens, Pack Attack, my favorite of the four, unlocks at 30, Pac-Mania unlocks at 100 tokens, and Miss Pac-Man unlocks at 180 tokens. There's also a jukebox that allows you to listen to any song from Pac-Man World 2 that unlocks at 60 tokens, which acts as a sort of sound test. So technically, you unlock these classic arcade games for collecting tokens. But Miss Pac-Man is hardly a worthwhile bonus for collecting almost every token in the game. As far as the last 9 tokens go, they don't give you anything, so there's honestly no reason to get any more once you've collected 180. While I do find all these unlockable bonus games fun, forcing the player to collect a bunch of tokens to play them is kind of annoying, and not really a worthwhile incentive in my opinion. pac Tech though, that game is great. Let's get back on track though. I've done a lot of complaining about how hard this game makes it to 100%, despite being designed with 100% completion in mind, and some of you may be thinking, why not just play the game without getting any collectibles, and fair enough. If you're like me and you get stuck on one section at the very end of a level and you keep having to kill yourself because you keep missing one item and you end up game overing on that section and redoing the entire level from the start twice before finally deciding to grind for lives just to get through this one part and you end up getting really frustrated and start wondering if it's even really worth it to put myself through hell to 100% the game, then yeah, you would want to just play through the game without getting collectibles too. However, some of the levels, most prominently in the earlier worlds, end up feeling really shallow. Every level in the first world can be finished in under a minute if you ignore the collectibles, whether you're an experienced speedrunner or not. The second world is a bit better, but the levels in that world can feel really repetitive since a lot of the level design from Treewood Forest is noticeably reused in the next level, Butane Pain. After that though, the levels get a lot longer and a lot more interesting. However, this just results in most of them being a total pain in the ass to 100%. Magma Opus' slide section nearly gave me a mental breakdown, and Blade Mountain can fuck off, but they don't really hold a candle to the utter bullshit that is Yellow Pack Marine. This level has Pac-Man controlling a submarine, firing missiles at oncoming fleets of mines, ghost ships, and ghost crab machines while dodging giant pipes. If you're playing the game without collecting anything, this level is a total snore fest because it's an auto-scroller that barely has any player involvement, and it goes on for 8 minutes! If you are going for 100%, this level is a fucking nightmare. There are checkpoints placed throughout the level at certain intervals, but because the scenery is so bland and the background set pieces literally loop as you play the level, there's no way to know when one is coming up. Twice I got halfway through the level, only to miss a fruit and hit a checkpoint before I was able to kill myself, meaning I had to start the entire 8 minute auto-scroller all over again. On top of that, the tokens have really bad hitboxes and can sometimes spawn in places where it's damn near impossible to collect them. 
Unfortunately, in my run of the level, I got all eight in one go, and when you collect a token, it turns into a health wedge when you replay the level. So I don't actually have footage of just how bad these hitboxes can be, and I was not going to play the entire game all over again from a new file just to get to Pac Marine and miss a token for footage. On top of all that, the cherry on top that makes this level just that much more infuriating is that the entire level is procedurally generated. There are set patterns of mines and pipes that you'll see repeated a lot throughout the level, but if you play the level twice in a row, you will not get the same or exact result. 20 cherries will spawn randomly throughout the minefields, 2 apples will spawn randomly next to pipes, and 5 oranges will spawn randomly from enemies. But whether or not the game actually spawns all of the fruit is also random. In fact, in my first full run through the level, I collected every cherry, killed every enemy, and collected both of the apples, and still only ended up with 26 of the 27 fruit, because one of the oranges just never spawned. What were they thinking? This level also has a few power-ups throughout the level, which I can only imagine was done to keep it from getting tedious, but only one of them is really any good, and it appears halfway through the level and disappears if you get hit. If they had cut down on the amount of fruit you needed to collect, made it completely consistent instead of RNG hell, and cut it down to maybe three minutes, it could have been passable. But as it is, Yellow Pack Marine is the worst level I've ever played in a video game. Ever. The other two water levels are better, but still pretty bad. Similarly to Pac-Marine, Scuba Duba and Shark Attack have you constantly moving forward. Unlike Pac-Marine, however, you can actually increase your speed by doing a short boost with the B button. In 100% runs, this is almost useless aside for breaking a few boxes since you'll be wanting to go as slow as possible so you don't miss any collectibles, but the clunky underwater controls make sure that you do anyway. In a normal run though, you'll just be mashing the B button to get through these boring slogs as quickly as possible. While we're talking about water, this game actually has some water in the normal platforming levels, but it only appears twice in the entire game. A small pond at the end of the first level, and a slightly larger pond that has almost nothing in it in the third level. The underwater controls in these sections aren't great, but it isn't used too much, so there's not a whole lot to complain about there. I'm just left wondering why they included this at all when it's extremely underused, and the majority of the game uses water for either auto-scrollers or instant death pits. Back to the water world, guess what they do for the boss? More fucking Pac Marine! You have to hit each of Mega Whale's propellers off to defeat it, and they each take 9 hits to destroy. But once you destroy one, you have to sit through 30 seconds to a minute of boring fucking nothing to wait for Mega Whale to come back so you can hit another propeller off. And all the damage to each propeller gets reset every time you destroy one, similarly to the eyes of King Galaxian from Pac Man World 1. In fact, this boss is similar to that one in a lot of ways Auto Scholar shoot em up, 4 targets, breaks with enemies in between each cycle, gets harder as the fight goes on. But where King Galaxian is challenging, engaging, fun, and satisfying, Mega Whale is a slow, boring, annoying boss that takes no effort to defeat at all. While we're on the subject, let's talk about the bosses. I've already discussed Mega Whale, but the rest of them are fairly simple. Blinky has a giant mechanical frog that you butt bounce on three times, then rev roll on three times. Simple and easy, but it kind of drags on a bit. But it's the first boss, so whatever. Inky, Pinky, and Clyde, however, are all the exact same fucking thing, just progressively more complex or difficult. It feels like one boss fight split into three phases, but rather than one engaging, challenging fight, it's split up into three fights that all just drag on for too long, especially Clyde. Spooky is by far the best boss in the game, since he challenges your ability to apply all of Pac-Man's moves and take him down. You have to rev roll around the arena to chase him down, kickflip Spooky to damage him, and butt bounce on the enemy Spooky occasionally spawns to regain health. This fight has just the right amount of challenge and is actually one of my favorite final boss fights. While we're here, let's talk about the ending. Pac-Man makes it through the Evil Tree's Ghost Bayou Maze with all five golden fruits in hand, and transforms into Golden Pac-Man, which is literally just a slightly more yellow Pac-Man. No new abilities or increased power or decreased damage from enemies, just a color change. Anyway, he confronts Spooky back in the center of Pac Village, and Spooky uses his magic to lift the center circle of town up high into the air, and Pac-Man and Spooky have their final showdown suspended in a swirling tornado. Pac-Man then defeats Spooky, sealing him in the Golden Fruit Tree for good, and the day is saved. The whole town celebrates, and Chomp Chomp chases the ghosts off into the distance. The credits roll, and Pac-Man World 2 comes to its end. So now that I feel like I've really covered everything there is to say about this game, does it hold up? Hell no, this game is flawed beyond belief, and not in ways that I can easily forgive it for like in the case of my last review, Sonic Adventure. I even said to myself while I was getting footage for this review, I would much rather be playing Sonic Adventure right now. Not to draw needless comparisons, I just meant to point out that this game has problems. This game has a lot of really bad problems that hold it back from being a great game. 
but despite the many issues I have with it, the frustrations of 100%ing it, and the absolute dumpster fire that is Yellow Pac-Marine, I would still actually recommend this game. Pac-Man World 2 has great physics, tight controls, and mostly great level design. I love levels like Into the Volcano, Haunted Boardwalk, and Night Crawling, and in that sense, it is a good game. However, Pac-Man World 2 also comes with a slew of flaws. It doesn't handle being a collectathon particularly well, it has a few cases of bad level design like the entire water world in Blade Mountain, and it can be incredibly frustrating. So in that sense, it's not a good game. Despite the glaring issues, I would still recommend Pac-Man World 2, but if you do play it, I recommend you play it like this. Go for 100% in the first two worlds, but once you get to World 3, just play through the levels normally. Maybe look for some tokens to unlock a couple of the arcade games like Pack Attack. I know that's really specific, and it would probably be a hard sell since I spent most of this review bashing this game, but it is genuinely fun and has some great moments. It just happens to also have some not so great moments. As much as it pains me to say this, Pac-Man World 2 is a mediocre game. I've always loved this game ever since I was a kid, and to an extent I still do, but it can really be a pain in the ass to play sometimes, so if you do pick it up, approach it with caution. So that wraps up the review. I hope it ends up better than my last review. I kind of ignored fixing certain issues with it just because I really wanted to get it out, but in retrospect I should have focused more on the gameplay and not talked as much about the story. Anyways, I hope you guys enjoyed this review. Let me know what you thought in the comments, and I'll see you guys in the next one. Thanks for watching.